Good morning, my name is Jenny Biggs, J-E-N-N-I-E-B-I-G-G-S. I am a parent representative on the local school council of Sheridan Elementary in Bridgeport. Last week, on behalf of 375 LSC members from over 140 schools, I presented a citywide LSC letter to the unelected Board of Education about problems with the special education budgeting process this year. And we were completely dismissed by Board President Clark and CEO Claypool. CEO Claypool said that there is no problem with this process. President Clark dismissed me and my fellow LSC member signers before I even spoke. Just because you say it doesn't mean it's true, was basically what he said to me. Here's what is happening this year, and this is what is laid out in our citywide LSC letter. CPS changed the way it funds special education at the school level. CPS gave each school the same amount of special education funding as last year, minus 4%. They co-mingled special education funds with general education funds, then told principals and LSCs to figure it out while offering up the 4% withheld funds in a tra non-transparent special education quote-unquote appeals process. If this commingling of funds is allowed to continue, special education funding will be untrackable and non-transparent to the detriment of all students. The commingling of special education funds and general education funds is pitting special education versus general education programs in a Hunger Games manner, which is not healthy for our schools. This is a district level issue we are presenting the citywide LSC letter to the mayor today because our collective voices have been ignored and we feel CPS has engaged in a bad practice that should be changed. We are hoping the mayor will listen to the almost 600 elected LSC members from 179 schools who have signed this letter thus far and engage with us, fellow elected officials, to determine solutions. To be clear, this is a district level issue. A district level policy is not working and needs to be changed. We stand in support of our principals who have been placed in a terrible position thanks to CPS's terrible special education budgetary parameters. LSCs consist of parents, community members, teachers, non-teaching staff, the principal, and at the high school level, a student. LSCs approve the school budget, they work on the school's improvement plan, they evaluate and hire principals. Not only that, we are physically inside our schools, volunteering, and we often are the people that fellow parents come to if there is an issue. We LSC members know what is happening in our schools, and we know how district level policy actually plays out at the school level. Our first speaker is Maggie Barron. She is an LSC parent representative on Hitch Elementary's LSC. Thank you, Jenny. My name is Maggie Barron, M-A-G-G-I-E-B-A-R-A-N. And like Jenny said, I'm an elected parent representative for Hitch Elementary School's local school council. I was unable to procure a two-minute speaking slot at today's board meeting as all the speaking spots for public participation were gone within just a few moments of registration opening. Otherwise, I'd be speaking to them instead of being here with you. This year, local school councils and principals were tasked with approving a budget that is based on this new formula and places funding for diverse learners within the general school budget. The funding schools are given is already inadequate. And this commingling of funds combined with the pressure put on principals and LSCs to do more with less is creating a dangerous and non-inclusive environment where the requirements for some students are pitted against the needs of all. Our appeals and requests to CPS leadership to revisit these formulas and adjustments have been denied with no reasons given or transparency offered into their process or decision making. A response that we received from a leader at CPS asked us to individually name students that were having issues, which is a definite misunderstanding of our problem and certainly not an invitation to dialogue. Our elected local school councils and our principals are committed to serving all of our students 
and fulfilling our continuous work improvement plans, our goals and objectives. We are committed to doing more with less, less money, less support, less acceptable service from contractors, and less trust and transparency from CPS leadership and the Board of Education. We have, however, little decision-making power or communication channels to the appointed Board of Education outside of these public participation speaking slots. Our city needs to understand, and that's why I'm here, that our CPS Board of Education is not working with us and is certainly not working for our children. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, Maggie brought up an important point that we haven't touched upon yet, and that is that funding overall is inadequate. And this commingling of fun is, funds is actually becoming dangerous uh, with the inadequate funding and this bad policy. Um, it's, uh, I'll just leave it there. Uh, LSC parent representatives are pretty valuable to a school. Not only do we offer time and energy, we have kids physically in classrooms. We not only understand the big school picture, we hear directly from our kids what is happening at a smaller scale. Our next speaker is Caroline Balicki. She is an LSC parent representative on Disney 2's LSC. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'm Caroline Balicki, C-A-R-O-L-I-N-E, Balicki, B as in boy, I-L-I-C-K-I. -I. And as Jenny said, I'm a parent of three children at Disney II Magnet School. I was elected as a parent representative to the school's LSC, and I'm currently serving my third term. I'm here today to tell you a story, a story about what happens in individual classrooms to individual students for individual teachers all across the city. A story about what happens when CPS does not fund its schools adequately and appropriately. A story, just one of them, about what has happened in my children's school as a result of huge funding cuts, insufficient resources, and over-reliance on technology, and the commingling of special education and general education funds to the detriment of everyone. This is not a story about my dyslexic children who receive support under individual education programs or IEPs. This is not a story about them, although it could be. This is a story of how my middle school student is floundering. He is floundering in his world language class as a result of the funding policy that CPS adopted this year. 35 students in his class. I'm going to say that again. 35 in a language class. We estimate that one-fifth of the class have IEPs. Half of the class is disruptive. They're in junior high. This is not a time when students are motivated learners, even under the best of circumstances. This situation is the worst of circumstances. The teacher can either teach or manage discipline. And with the, such, a, such a high incidence of children who need extra support, the teacher is failing at both. And my child is in danger of failing this class. There simply isn't enough teacher to go around. To address this, my school hired a SICA to assist in this class in November, which, as you know, is the end of the first quarter. This is a small improvement, but it's incomprehensible to me that the 35 students in the class have had to wait almost three months to begin their learning. How is this an appropriate education for anyone? At this point, both my child and I would rather he forego a year of language and go into study hall. But he can't go into study hall, because even with a total enrollment of 1,100 students, there is no staffing and no budget to support a study hall. There are, however, Chromebooks. Technology is not a solution to everything. Disney II opened in 2008 under a student-based budgeting model. In 2012, the school received $6,100 per student, plus line item budgets line item positions for magnet and special education teaching and support staff. The Disney II maxim is where learning is fun, but for students m like mine this year, school no longer is. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Late last week, the head of CPS's Office of Diverse Learner Supports and Services, Pat Baccalieri, emailed every LSC member who signed the letter, asking each of us to hand over specific information from IEPs. LSC members can't do this, and LSC members won't do this, as it would violate privacy laws. Our next speaker, Dawn Moon, 
is an LSC parent representative from Kilmer, Kilmer Elementary. She is going to discuss this and more. Hi, my name is Dawn, D-A-W-N-E, Moon, M-O-O-N, and um, as Jenny said, I'm an elected parent member of Kilmer's local school council. So on last Thursday, December 1st, every LSC member who signed our letter about the commingling of special ed and general ed funds received a response signed by Pat Bassellari insisting that principals were instructed to fund individual IEPs first, which is absurd because IEPs can come in at any time of the year. Um, and requesting that LSC members forward the specific names of any diverse learners who are not receiving the support CPS is required by law to give them. I am certain that as Chief of Diverse Learner Supports and Services, Dr. Bassellari is aware that it would be a violation of FERPA for LSC members to obtain or relay this information. His response struck me as a clumsy effort to silence LSC members while making individual principals the scapegoats for the inadequate funding of our public schools. Appropriately allocating both state and federal funds for each student based on their individual needs is a huge responsibility, which is why it is best managed centrally. The district appears to have done no analysis of the impact of implementing student-based budgeting, particularly for diverse learners, with no budget in place. It's just smoke and mirrors to hide the inadequate district support for the most vulnerable students, to pit people against each other, and to shift blame onto our principals. We're not falling for it. It appears to me that CPS is setting itself up for another lawsuit of the same magnitude or greater than Corey H., which was a class action suit about, about special education services for CPS students. It stretched out for more than a decade and cost the district millions and millions of dollars. The issue won't be exactly the same, but as a parent, an LSC member, it seems to me that CPS is being not just callous, but clumsy in inviting another expensive lawsuit, and they're harming our schools in the process. Chicago Public Schools money should not be going to lawyers. It should be going to our schools. Thank you. And now, to put it all in perspective and with some analysis, we have Rod Estfan, Education Policy Analyst from Access Living. Hi, I'm Rod Estvan, uh, R-O-D-E-S-T-V-A-N. Uh, I'm the Policy Analyst for Access Living of Chicago. I've been doing this kind of work uh, for 20 years. I've been doing analysis of CPS special ed budgets for at least that long. Uh, I think that the LSEs that wrote the letter to Chicago Public Schools grasped immediately the problem with co-mingling uh, of funds and how it's being used to pit one side against the other. Uh, and I think it was brilliant. And I think that the CPS response on this issue uh, is, is a big problem. And asking for IEPs is a big problem. And I'll tell you, I see these IEPs because families come to us for services. And we often uh, refer out families for litigation against Chicago public schools. And what Chicago public schools are not telling people and not telling the media is when they enter in negotiations and they concede the fact that they violated a child's right, they make them sign a non-disclosure agreement. Does everybody understand what we're talking about here? A binding legal document that tells those parents they cannot go public with their settlement agreement with the Chicago Public Schools. This happens over and over and over again. And therefore, those families that I am under an ethical obligation to get litigation services for cannot become witnesses against the Chicago Public Schools for violations of their IEPs. And this is something that is not understood in the media and is not understood in the public unless a family has entered this process. And it's, it's a huge problem. The other thing that Chicago Public Schools is highly aware of are decisions made in the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals that happened post the Corey H case that was referenced. And that's primarily the Jamie S versus Milwaukee case, which greatly limits the ability of litigators to do class action litigation in special ed. Not impossible, but much more difficult. So in that context, Chicago Public Schools has utilized a law that has been on the books since 1995 called the block, the block Grant Law. 
And that entitles Chicago Public Schools to get funds in a way from the state that are not categorical to each disabling condition. However, from 95 up until last year, they kept their accounting system based on disabling conditions. So I could look at the budget and see money for autism, money for learning disabilities, money for students with significant cognitive disabilities. That was all wiped out this year. All the money was flowed through several big accounting funds, and I can no longer tell any of these issues when I look at this analytically. And so we're seeing the reality of this. But here's another reality that the parents are seeing that I'm getting calls about, and that is the choices that principals have to make. Because they cannot get these resources, they're making terrible choices. I can tell you there are four elementary schools that are regrouping disabled students who are in the general ed classrooms into specific rooms for higher levels of services, meaning that they have multiple second grade rooms. They're pushing the disabled children more and more into one classroom in order to provide services in a more efficient manner. That is not good for the learning environment of those classrooms. It's creating an imbalance. They're meeting the legal standard of a 70-30 rule, which is 70% non-disabled and 30% disabled, but they're gonna have classrooms that will have no disabled students. And you're gonna have bitterness from regular ed teachers who are teaching these classrooms over the burden that they're faced. You also have, and today, the Chicago Teachers Union will be speaking to this at the board meeting, many burdens that they have to carry out to get additional services for their students. These are huge barriers that are being placed and there is great dissatisfaction. And the last problem is, because of all of this, we are not able to recruit special education teachers into Chicago. We have hundreds of vacancies for special education teachers with no end in sight to this. Because if you're a young special education teacher, which is already uh, in, in deep need in, in the state of Illinois, why come to Chicago where you're faced with these kinds of burdens? So we have a multiplicity of problems and I assume that uh, the media might want to ask some questions at this point, right? Sure, so what we're going to do is we can take some questions and then we also are delivering um, a letter to the mayor today. We don't know if the mayor is aware of the special education funding process that's been set up and we'd like to inform him that this has caused great difficulty in the budgeting process. Uh, so we are delivering the citywide LSE letter to his office today. Uh, we have almost 600 signatures on it right now from 179 schools. We are asking the mayor um, for a better special education budgeting process and the ability to actually engage with CPS as LSC members because that does not exist right now. So we're going to turn around and see if we can get somebody from the office to come out and maybe talk to us. Emily's in charge. Should I, should I take this microphone? <laughs> My name is Emily Fong. I am a parent representative from the Souter Montessori Magnet LSE. This is a letter outlining um, all of our concerns about the new uh, budget for the 2016-17 academic year. Uh, we reject this budget. We see major problems and all of those issues have been outlined in this letter and we hope that the mayor will take it seriously and address these concerns so that there's fair funding for all of our kids in CPS schools. Thank you. And if you need to follow up with somebody. Thank you. And there you have it. Um. <laughs> there, there was a thank you, so that's something, right? Um, okay, if you have any questions, we're happy to take them. Um, we are also have, um, some of us are heading over to the Board of Education meeting. Um, we've signed up to speak today. Uh, some of us tried to sign up to speak, but spots were gone in three minutes, which was already maybe mentioned, um, that that's pretty much the only way we can engage with CPS as LSE members.
when she was talking about the classroom that her son was in, I imagine this was a, a non special ed son. Yes. And yes. what was going on in that classroom was that the, what you were saying, which is that all the special ed kids were placed into that four language class and the size was ballooned. Um, so the. Yes. So the question was asking about um, Caroline's statement from Disney 2. Um, Caroline was talking about her son who is not a special education student. Uh, she was referencing that the class size is huge, 35, and that there were several children in the class that have IEPs. Um, I, th yeah, why don't you talk? No, no. Yeah, here. Well, there's, there's two issues. One, one is the issue of IEPs not being met, which can be resolved through a legal process, and then you have you know, issues with that. But also, there's the pedagogical issue, and that is students with disabilities require attention. Regular education teachers in, a, in, in those classrooms are the primary frontline forces that are dealing. Special education teachers are supplementary. So if you're putting more and more attention pressure on those teachers and not distributing it throughout the building, you're making it more difficult for everyone to achieve. Under a normal distribution of students with disabilities, there's no evidence at all that it drags down non-disabled students or higher performing students. But when you're concentrating kids, you're changing the whole environment that, of, of the classroom. So I think that that's what the parent was talking about. And, and it's, a big, it's a big problem. And it's like it doesn't exist uh, for Chicago public schools. They don't want to talk about this. And, and it's a problem. And it's not that regular ed parents are prejudicial against disabled kids. They want all children to learn. LSCs and principals want all children to learn. But they're being forced to make terrible choices because of the way that they've commingled these budgets. And it's not illegal what they're doing under statute. They can do this, but the problem with changing the statute is if you eliminate the statute that allows Chicago to commingle the funds, you're eliminating an additional $200 million because Chicago benefits to the tune of $200 million more than it would if it went to a different system of accountability for, on the block grant. So that it's a dilemma, and we've had these discussions in Springfield, and it hasn't worked out. We haven't been able to find a solution to this. And it, there may be a legislative fix, but we haven't seen it. So the district. Yeah, go ahead. Playful, for example, has consistently told parents who have complained about this issue show us the evidence that you have. And Dr. Right. Dr. said in his letter as well. Is there any kind of handle or estimate or idea as to how many students right now aren't having their IEPs met, their legally mandated needs met because of this? this yeah, so the question is, is there an estimate on, on denial of special education services uh, in terms of uh, having IEPs not met? And I would say of the students that are identified, that I, I can't give you a number because I, just like CPS does, we get the, the complaints as they flow in. Uh, my estimation of the complaint flow is it's not abnormally high. But, but the complaint flow for students that are not being identified is much higher. By that, I mean students that they're simply not allowing to go through the process of identification, primarily because of intervention systems and delay tactics that are being done. So as you can see in the response to the LSCs, in the letter that CPS wrote, their big concern is identification levels, right? Well, identification levels equal money. And they're trying to reduce the total number of disabled students even though Chicago Public Schools is well within the average of the state of Illinois, and for a district that has 80% plus low-income students, it's actually quite low. And even in their own analysis, when they look at other districts, they're much lower than, let's say, Boston, which they consider to be an exemplary district. So that, you know, those are some of the dilemmas. And, one, you know, of course, the problem for me is, I'm not going to give Mr. Claypool a family's IEP because Mr. Claypool, we will lose all of our litigation rights if I simply hand it over. I want to follow a process. So I want to follow a formal mediation process 
or a formal appeals process through the state. So they have litigation rights all the way up to the federal courts if it fails. And so, the, and most ethical advocates and lawyers are gonna do that. They're not gonna go make a deal unless they come into an IEP meeting and say, we'll change the IEP right now, you know, at the meeting and it's a done deal and then it's over. That does happen and it does happen with me. But we're not gonna start sending, you know, dozens and dozens of IEPs to Mr. Claypool for resolution. That's not the way that this system is designed to do. That's, that's, it's a system the way Chicago operates, right? Isn't that the way Chicago operates with deal making and all those kind of things? That's a real Chicago way to operate. Might be way they operated over at the Park District, but it's not the way I'm gonna operate at Chicago Public Schools. Rod Estvan. Rod Estvan. E All right. Thank you everyone so much for coming. This is really a super important issue um, for all of the children of Chicago. So we really appreciate you being able to tell and amplify our story and the stories of so many children. Thank you.